I have miles and miles ahead of me Tales to listen to, time to spend Up ahead the road is bending Wonder what's around the bend Hello, I'm Charles Kuralt. We're off again to meet a few people on the back roads of America. These are people you know, not from the front pages. They've never been on the front pages. They're people you know from next door and down the block. Their stories are some of my favorites from 25 years on the road. What follows hereafter is a record of some distinctly American transformations. In Texas, for instance, long ago, a lonely, hardworking, ill-rewarded figure was transformed into a symbol of the heart and soul of this country. We will visit the cowboy, as he was and as we longed for him to be. In Pittsburgh, another transformation of a mild-mannered short-order cook turned by bad luck into a figure almost as beleaguered as Job of the Bible. The life of Charlie Lonnie is not a study in bitterness, however. It's a study in sweet forbearance. Transformation is the whole idea behind Trading Day in Scottsboro, Alabama. This is where folks transform jackknives into hound dogs and hound dogs into butter churns. Meet Vic Sianka. At the Pittsburgh corner of Liberty and Wood, he has transformed himself from traffic cop to conductor. The first transformation we'll watch happens every year in the Napa Valley of California, where sunlight becomes wine. Wine is sunshine to begin with. It is the sun on a hundred summer mornings rising above the tree line to commence its constant hours of baking down upon the hillside vineyards above the Napa Valley. There are not many places where the sun is just right, some in sunny Italy, some in Burgundy, the Loire Valley, and here in this small place where most of America's best table wines come from. To begin with, wine is sun. It is also water, soil, minerals, vitamins, carbohydrates, pigment, acid, tannin. That's a chemist's way of looking at it. The winemaker's way is a little different. To a winemaker, wine is most of all waiting. You plant the vines and then you wait. You wait for years and let the sun work. And in the year the grapes are to be picked, you wait for months. The spring comes, the grapes appear, and still you wait. And the summer comes and passes, and you hope it doesn't rain too much or too little, and you wait. And then, in this season, if you are Brother Justin of the Christian Brothers, you pick a grape or two and squeeze the juice into a refractometer to discover the sugar content. I think uh, most people think of making wine as a very romantic occupation. Is there any romance to it, or is it all grubby work in the fields? Oh, I think uh, probably uh, some of both. There's certainly a lot of romance to it. Uh, there's a real challenge. I guess uh, we winemakers uh, think of ourselves as some sort of artists. Uh, we're working with a very raw material product and trying to produce something very special. When it's time to get the grapes off and to uh, crush them and make wine, uh, the hours don't mean too much to you. You simply have to get it done when they're ripe. Uh, and I, I think it's uh, like so many things. Uh, uh, it gets in your blood. and. Uh, while you kind of look on it with a little dread, you know you're going to be tired and dragging for two or three months. Uh, it's something that uh, if you weren't around when harvest time came, <laughs> you'd be awfully disappointed. You'd be uh, just very anxious to get back to where the action is. The Christian brothers sell their wine to help support their schools in the West. But before they can sell it, they must make it. And before they can make it, they must wait, like all the other winemakers of the valley. The conversation at this season is chiefly reports from the vineyards. When will the gray Riesling be ready, or the Pinot Noir? So the days pass, 
until finally there comes a day that is different. First come the Riesling, then the Semillon, then the Cabernet Sauvignon, and suddenly test after test from vineyard after vineyard shows that the grapes are ready. The waiting is over. The winemakers know what has happened, the sun. The sun has done its work. Stop for coffee here at Lonnie's Diner on South Main Street in the west end of Pittsburgh. And you think you've got troubles? Meet Charlie Lonnie. How about gravy, Pat? Good, no. gravy. There you go. <laughs> Charlie Lonnie has more problems than you have, whoever you are. Charlie Lonnie makes Job look like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. This man, known all around here as a former trumpet player, a nice guy, and the best short order cook in this part of town, has big problems. And they are all burglars. Loney's Diner has been burgled more than any place in the West End, or Pittsburgh, or maybe the world. How many robberies have there been in all? Uh, it was 161 times up until January the 7th this year. And it's been three since that, and a couple of broken windows. That, uh, not included. The half a dozen I didn't even report before that. So it must be roughly, I'd say, about 170 times in all. What have they stolen from you? Everything. Everything. Toaster, cigars, cigarettes, meat, pop, tools, flashlight. Anything that's not nailed down. Last time they got a $109 toaster. I bought a new radio. Brand new, got it wholesale, cost me 32 bucks. I even put it in the safe. For two weeks I had it. They stole the safe at all. They drug it over behind the billboard, broke the lock open, stole all the cigarettes and radio too. Out of uh, 165 uh, robberies, has uh, one been any worse than the others? Well, the worst one was on the Christmas. And uh, there wasn't anything in here to steal outside of a pistachio nut machine had about 35 cents in it. This kid broke in the window, and he stole that 35 cents out of the possession of the machine. So I found out who did it. And I went up and I questioned him. And uh, he said, no, he didn't do it. His mother said, no, he says his dad gave him $4 on Christmas so he would stay out of trouble. Just a little kid. So I have hard around about, about it, and I said, well, I said, it wouldn't have been so bad if you'd have closed the door when you went out. All my pipes froze underneath that place. He says, I did close the door. <laughs> <laughs> His mother says, you what? Yeah, he says, I closed the door. I didn't leave the door open. Well, that time all my pipes froze underneath the place, and I couldn't have got a plumber for $150 to put some pipes back in. You had to lay on your belly and saw down through the floor to put them pipes in there. And that plumber wouldn't even look at it for $150. That was the worst time. For 35 cents. When was the first theft, anyway? About 25 years ago. Before I came in, it's all for my mother. And they've been stealing from you ever since. Who does it? You have any idea? That's a sixty-four dollar question. <laughs> Kids, grown-ups, anybody that wants something, they just seem to help themselves. But it's been going on for so long. Well, one generation, another generation, the kids grow up. They grow up, they come back in, they brag about how many times they broke in a place. There's nothing you can do about it. What can you do about it? That's what hurts. They sit there and look at you, just like you and I. Tell you how many times they broke in a place and laugh. How long are you going to put up with how this? How long am I going to put up with it? Well, I don't have a pension plan, so how long can I last? Let's put it that way. When I run out of gas, that's when I quit. Well, that's the story. If there is a man among us with more fortitude, we would like to meet him. Like a sandbagged bunker in enemy territory, Lonnie's Diner still stands. 
Charlie Lawney figures that's only because none of the thieves has figured out a way to put wheels on it and drive it away. Let us say you want a hound dog. Of course, you could just go and buy a hound dog, but that is not the idea. The idea is to trade your pocket knife for a better pocket knife, and that pocket knife for a mouth organ, and that mouth organ for a mandolin, and that mandolin for a butter churn, and that butter churn for a spinning wheel, and that spinning wheel for a harness, and that harness for a hound dog. That is the principle under which Trading Day in Scottsboro has been operating all the years of this century. The sights and sounds of Trading Day take you back to the beginnings of this country. A man who looks vaguely like Puck, a mythical figure of fun much loved by earlier Americans, dances a jig by way of advertising that he has a banjo to trade. What'll you take for your banjo, Puck? A bedstead, a steer horn, or a flintlock musket? What'll you take? A pair of wagon wheels, dusty from the road, a saddle or a harness, or a mason jar full of golden honey? What will you take for your banjo? The basic currency of Trading Day is jackknives. All day long, the old men stand in their own corner of the courthouse square. A man does not part easily with a good jackknife, so there are far more trades turned down than made. I got a good knife. Yeah, there. them stirring, but I can't trade them. <laughs> I could left to use that to shave with. Yeah, you take that. Huh? You want that? Oh, I'd have to have four dollars. You worth it? Yeah. <laughs> How much? How much you say? Four dollars. No. How much? <laughs> you done bluff me. Go ahead. <laughs> but trading day is not just for old men. Here is Johnny Reel, jaw set, intent on his purpose. He has brought a beagle named Redhead to the square, and his purpose is to go home with a different dog. He moves quickly. There's no time to lose. What do you want for them, Doc? $45. $45. They mate. No, they're not mates. I don't much want to swap. Hey, Trey, man. Let me walk around a little bit. I just got here. In another corner of the courthouse square, another man, oblivious to the crowds, plays an ancient tune on an almost new guitar. Play it while you can, guitar player. It's trading day in Scottsboro, and there's a man with a banjo looking for you. These are the sensitive hands of an orchestra conductor preparing for his big moment. Vic Sienka's big moment comes every afternoon at 4 o'clock, just before the rush hour, at the corner of Liberty and Wood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. His orchestra is streetcars and taxis and 12-ton diesels, and Vic Sienka conducts his symphony of sound and movement with a finesse that would have dazzled Toscanini. Moreover, he keeps Liberty and Wood a democratic intersection. Black or white, rich or poor, long-haired hippie or bald businessman, on this corner, all are equal in the sight of the law. Move over, boy. Hiya, Curly. Just look at them to the Italian cigars. They'll kill you. Listen to that whistle. Music is where you find it. And in Pittsburgh, you find it at the corner of Liberty and Wood. No 
hero of the American drama ever had a more spectacular stage than this on which to play his part. And no stage ever gave us such a bold and enduring hero. Whenever we think about our past, he is there. Even those Americans who have never seen him have known him all their lives. A dusty man of few words, on horseback with chaps and spurs, wearing a Stetson low over his eyes. The cowboy. Texas gave us the cowboy. Chances are, as a matter of historical fact, he was a Mexican or a black man or a disillusioned towhead kid in the tattered remnants of a Confederate uniform. In those lost days of the 1860s and 70s, Texas sent him along with the Longhorn herds up the Chisholm Trail to Abilene, and from there, by story and song, to the whole world. And so when we wanted to find him again, we came back to Texas, to one of the big ranches west of the Pecos, one that extends over the mountains and through the canyons for 40 miles or more, where the spring roundup still takes a month of hard riding. It is Herbert Kokernot's ranch. It was his father's, and his grandfather and his great-grandfather, a scout for Sam Houston, were ranchers too. It will be the ranch of Chris Lacey, Herbert Kokernot's grandson, with whom the old man consults on the future with the knowledge of generations past. This is where we came to look for the cowboy. We found him much changed from the legend. He herds Herefords now, not Longhorns, and he leaves his six-gun on the shelf back home much changed and unchanged. Still, the long days in the saddle commencing at dawn with the ranch manager's signal to move out. Still the ride into the sun, in the certain knowledge that the ride will not end until the sun goes down. Still the elusive steers and heifers unaccustomed to riders on horseback and bawling their unwillingness to be herded as they must be twice a year. Still the hard West Texas wind, still the hot West Texas sun, still the black storm clouds that force a man to break out his poncho on a day that dawned fair and promising. All that is unchanged. Still the bullfight. Why do they fight? Is not a 10-mile drive into the wind enough to take the wind out of them? Still the bullfight that must be broken up. Still, the danger of a sudden movement, an instant of fright that can spook a rounded up herd and send it bolting for freedom. Still, the stampede that has to be turned by cursing men on galloping horses unless the whole day's work is to be lost, has to be, and is. Still the calf that breaks away, so small that he's hardly worth running down for the promise of 25 cents a pound six months or a year from now, but who must be run down. Still the skittish calf and still the bucking horse, still the danger of being thrown or dragged and crippled. Still the branding. New calves and yearlings still have to be herded into a high country pen, thrown on their sides and sat on. The pen was made of barbed wire and cottonwood limbs and goes back to the turn of the century. The brand, 06, was young Chris Lacey's great, great, great grandfather's and goes back to before there was a Texas. Still the fire in camp at the end of day. All this is the way it has always been. It is passing strange that such hard and dirty, wind-blown work should have made of this frozen and bone-weary, entirely mortal man a legend. He does not look the part. We do not like our legends off their horses. The punishing reality of the cowboy's life always yields in our memory to the shining dream. There he is, the embodiment of bold action, straight talk, and rough justice, the self-sufficient man of contained pride. That is the way we wanted him to be. And we grew up wanting to be him. Well, time to say goodbye until our next trip together. 
We've heard about a story up the road here, but we kind of hope we never get there. With luck, we'll stumble upon something more interesting along the way. I can see the road is bending. Wonder what's around the bend. All these years I've been a wonder Just when I think I'm near the end I always see the road is bending And I wonder what's around the bend 